so I come from that other country known as California. <laughs> and uh, I also, uh, normally I'm the person that is asked to get up first and say, OK, here's what's changing. Here's how fast it's changing. Um, here's what's at risk. Uh, you know, in a physical environment sense. Okay, now all of you guys talk, and then I sit and take notes, and I learn a lot from you. And here I am. I'm supposed to be the last one. And so my normal, uh, my normal shtick is not, is not necessary at this point. Uh, what I want to do is highlight a couple of things that I think that we haven't talked about. And then I want to talk a little bit about what it looks like as an outsider that the business community can really add to this entire space that we've spent the day talking about. So uh, this is the view. Uh, pretty much it's the view outside of my office window. Uh, it's that other ocean, the Pacific. And I show it to you. This is, this is an icon of San Diego and of, of the community. Uh, it's the Scripps Oceanography Pier. And uh, I show it to you because really this whole story began right at the end of that pier in 1957. In 1952, uh, our then director, Roger Ravel, published an incredibly important paper uh, with his colleague, Hans Seuss. And they used uh, carbon-14 dating and isotopic analysis to show that only 25% of the CO2 going into the atmosphere as a result of fossil fuel burning was dissolving in the ocean. Now, why was that important? It was because before that time, people assumed that more than 90% of it was dissolving in the ocean. And therefore, there was no climate change problem. Uh, and you know, this whole issue of CO2 has been with us a long time. A Nobel Prize winner, Svante Arrhenius, back in the 1880s, identified CO2 as a greenhouse gas responsible for us having a habitable climate and said, gee, we're burning a lot of it. It's going to be a problem someday. But then you know, the smart scientists got together and said, no, it's going into the ocean, so we don't have to worry. So 1952, um, Roger Ravel showed that that wasn't the case. And to prove it, he went out and he hired uh, a, an incredible analytical chemist who specialized in carbon. And that was Charles David Keeling. And this is the iconic curve of climate change. It is the CO2 going into the atmosphere year after year from 1957 when he started uh, measuring off of Scripps Pier. Then the next uh, summer started on Mauna Loa. Uh, and this was the reading uh, two days ago, uh, April 16th, uh, 409 ppm. And so this, what, this has been the proof that not everything was going into the ocean and that we would have a problem. Uh, so Scripps, although our name is oceanography, has been uh, a climate science place for a very long time. And we also got involved right away in climate modeling. We got involved in looking at the other impacts. So uh, in a way, that's why uh, somebody from that other country on the West Coast, California, uh, is out here talking to you. Um, I do want to just remind us that, that uh, we've been talking about extreme disruption. And you've actually been talking about it in two ways. One is extreme events, like floods, wildfires, et cetera. And you've been talking about it in terms of dramatic disruption, long, uh, permanent dis dramatic disruption, so extreme dr disruption in that sense. So I just want to remind us why 
the anthropogenic changes that we're seeing are resulting or, or uh, accompanied by extreme events. Um, first, with respect to temperature, uh, it changes the atmospheric circulation in ways that, uh, that allow for the buildup of a differential between nighttime heating and daytime heating. So in normal circumstances, uh, even, I, I grew up in Illinois, I spent time in DC. So even in, in climates like this, it gets really hot during the day, but it cools off at night. So you get a little bit of relief. But what, what the changes that have taken place have resulted in is a lack of nighttime cooling. So you just can't cool down. And the, the origin of these heat waves is not so much just the heat during the day, it's the lack of cooling at night. The second is the greater heat overall uh, increases evaporation and the strength of the hydrologic cycle. More water vapor in the atmosphere, more carrying capacity for big storms, whether those are um, hurricanes, uh, cyclones, uh, thunderstorms, bombogenesis, the, the newest uh, uh, meteorological term that we've all learned, etc. And on my coast, atmospheric rivers. Um, the ocean warming and glacial melt re raises sea level, as, and it's not so much, as uh, others pointed out, that uh, incremental uh, inundation. It's the storm surge that goes with it and how much higher the storm surge is. Uh, the rapidity of the change results in less adaptation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but our ability to model these extreme events has improved dramatically just in the last five years. Uh, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC report of uh, the fourth report, came out about eight years ago, uh, said we really couldn't say much about the, the predictability of these events uh, because we couldn't model them well. That has dramatically changed, and the next report that's coming out, which we've already seen the drafts of, talks about the statistics associated with extreme events. So uh, one of the aspects of heat that we haven't really talked about uh, is uh, the way that this is influencing people. And this is, uh, it's not a temperature measurement per se, it's a measure of heat wave activity. And uh, as I said, the most dangerous heat waves are the ones that don't cool off at night. And so all of the red, uh, this, this goes from about 1945 uh, to present, uh, the, the um, heat waves in red are ones that were characterized by greater uh, daytime than nighttime magnitude. But what we've seen is a growing uh, abundance of the ones where uh, we don't cool down. And that's a result of these changes in the atmosphere. And the urban, of, urban areas are, in general, uh, between one and seven degrees warmer than the surrounding area. And those, those, uh, that heat wave activity is in general. So just add to that, uh, the place where most of the people are is, uh, has an even greater magnitude in terms of heat wave. And it's resulting in really substantial human impacts. So this is a, uh, the middle graphic uh, shows the deaths associated with um, the 2010 heat wave in California. And uh, the, the biggest dots are uh, more than 10 deaths in the county. The smallest are, uh, the smallest is one to four deaths in the county. 99% of the deaths uh, were from people who lived in zip codes where more than 50% of the residents were, lived below the poverty guidelines. So this is also an issue of, uh, it's an environmental justice issue. 
Uh, lest you think that we're only talking about a few people, these are the death counts from the largest heat waves uh, that we've had uh, in the last um, 12 years. Um, 2010, Russian Federation, 56,000 deaths directly attributable to the heat wave. The next one you see is Italy, 2003. But if you add up Italy, France, Spain, Germany, Portugal, almost 70,000 deaths from a heat wave in the developed world in 2003. France in 2015, uh, that was um, 3,200 deaths. And most of those happened in August, when everybody in France goes on holiday. Most of those deaths were elderly that were left at home. Uh, so the reason that I bring this up is that uh, we've been talking about this as though uh, the business opportunities and the business relationships had to do mostly with products or with, um, with losses like uh, property, property and products. Uh, but this is another aspect of that. And I'm not talking about just the, the, the people that we lose, but all of the, the public health business nexus that's there, that's a very important part of the, the economy in this country. And we can't address this without the kind of public health uh, activity that's a governmental responsibility, but the people who actually carry out the activities are from the business community. It's the small businesses that are the, uh, the training, the, uh, the public health responders, and so forth. So two, key, two keys to adapting to the health threats of extremes uh, are the predictability, uh, and public health preparedness. So uh, the scientific community has, has been laser focused on the ability to predict heat waves. And you'll hear it in your, your weather predictions much more often uh, about the nature of the heat wave. And you'll start to hear all of that uh, public health preparedness uh, you know, this is the time to have plenty of water. This is the time to uh, get out of your home if you don't have air conditioning and don't have relief. But all of that is the business of responding, and it is generally done by the business community. Uh, a second uh, piece that we talked, a, we've talked a lot about um, the active hydrologic cycle, more in the sense of storms and floods, these two maps show two different ways of looking at that. On the left is the five-year maximum daily precipitation change uh, in, from the beginning of the last century until present. And the numbers, which you may not be able to see, are the, um, the number of, uh, is the percentage increase in that area in five, in, uh, five-day maximums that exceed the average. So here in New England, 27% uh, increase in the five-day maximum in precipitation uh, now compared to the uh, uh, beginning of the last century. Um, out in the West, only one, because the, the models also show us, and it's proving to be true, that that the, the change in the hydrologic cycle also focuses it uh, on, uh, the, on New England and the Northeast compared to the, the desert Southwest. The right-hand side is the 99th percentile pre precipitation. So the first one is, what's the maximum over five days? The second one is, how much higher is that at the 99th percentile level? And here in New England, 55% increase in the 99th percent level. So that's the most severe storms have increased by, in terms of rainfall, have increased by 55%. Uh, I, I, this is from the fourth climate, US climate assessment that was just published at the beginning of last year. And they, they uh, attributed everything, and they also gave an indication of their confidence in those numbers. And this is one 
where they have high confidence, 90% level confidence uh, in, in the fact that that is due to uh, human generated climate change as opposed to natural variability. Uh, so that also says that as we think about these, these problems, what you see in New England is not necessarily the same uh, as, as the experience of your business colleagues in the Midwest, in the Southwest, in the Pacific Northwest. So it's also that one size does not fit all. Uh, and the extremes will increase and even accelerate. So the frequency and intensity of high temperature events, and again, this is the statistical significance terms, virtually certain to increase, 99% level. Extreme precipitation events will very likely continue, 95% level, uh, to increase in frequency and intensity. So what we see now will get worse. Uh, and the frequency and intensity of atmospheric river events, the big flood events on our coast, will increase. And this is one that we haven't talked about. Nothing we've really talked about today touches on it or, or was highlighted uh, uh, by it. Soil moisture will continue to decrease, leading to large forest fires, but also leading to decreases in crop yields. So as we talk about agriculture, it's not just the floods. It's also the fact that soil moisture is decreasing in the entire grain belt, in the entire uh, truck farm, uh, vegetable farm area in the US. Uh, and that presents a risk for agriculture in a different way than just saying we've got to adapt to, uh, to storms or floods. Uh, so a little bit more on agriculture. Uh, and I want to emphasize that, that you know we now live in a globalized society and that a lot of the things that we talk about uh, in business we focus on here, but they're really, we sh our, part of our focus needs to be elsewhere. So the impact of disasters, uh, and this is largely flood and drought and crises on agriculture and food security, uh, uh, was uh, recently a new report came out last year on this from the FAO. 22% of the losses due to natural disasters in the developing world are in agriculture, and that, not including fisheries and forestry. And do, even in developing countries, the biggest losses are due to extreme events, especially rain and flood. This is something Lisa and I mentioned that even if uh, Mars is able to uh, deal with issues in the US, much of their supply chain is elsewhere. And if 22% of the losses are in places that our government does not control the, the uh, uh, food security for, that's a problem. That's, a pro that's also a problem for everyone who has a food supply chain that is uh, that goes beyond this country, and that's most of us. And the rate of adaptation is not keeping pace with the rate of change, especially in the developing world, but also in the US. Uh, I'm not going to go into this because I think other people talked about it a lot. Uh, I will, will just point out this is the sea level rise map uh, for, uh, for sea level rise in the uh, mid-90s to the mid-2000s, uh, and it's not even. You know, we talk about sea level rise as though the bathtub is just increasing everywhere, but it's not. For that decade, sea level rise was three times as fast uh, in the Western Pacific as it is in the Eastern Pacific. But if you look at what's happening now, it's exactly the reverse, and that's part of a a normal uh, decadal shift that takes place in the Pacific. So a, a, another message here is that when we look at, at what we think we're adapting to, uh, we have to look at it as it is evolving, uh, lest we make assumptions that we don't have to worry about climate, about sea level rise on the West Coast, um, because it's not going to happen. 
in, in fact, it is, uh, uh, it is going on now. Uh, so I won't talk about that. So a couple of things, uh, looking at this from a person who, I, I, have, I, I spent four years in the private sector, but I'm not an expert on it like you are. But I wanted to, the main message that I want to give you is that this sense of the private sector being able to just go on and do it yourselves, react to this, mitigate your risks, and go on, I think is a myth. Uh, this group has to actively engage with government because too much of your risk profile is out of your control. So Sanjay this morning told us that the, the critical thing about climate change was that it was slow change and therefore people don't get excited about it, that it's global uh, so we don't control all of it, that it's irreversible and uncertain. So the normal business cycle pressures and incentives really don't operate at the right time scale, or that should be spatial scale, not special scale. Thank you, uh, autocorrect, uh, for, for global change. Uh, a lot of other, uh, pers and then I want to hone in on a couple of those perspectives. So Colby, this more is Colby still here? Everybody's gone. Colby, you are there. So you talked about uh, flood zone identification and the fact that uh, you can identify it, but if, uh, if government doesn't uh, change the rules for flood insurance uh, or if uh, a local government is able to outweigh uh, the modelers who actually know what's going on, that you're stuck. You know, you have an unrealistic model for insurance. So uh, the insurance business knows exactly what's going on and what they would need to do to maintain their business viability. Uh, but we're in a situation where the, the business doesn't control that. It's really a government uh, intervention that says we'll continue to uh, allow people to, to build uh, in flood zones where we know that they have a high risk of, of being flooded. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm saying that business doesn't control it. Uh, Eleanor talked about microgrids, and, and you brought up the question about the vulnerability there. Uh, in the 30s, uh, the public utilities law, national law, went into place, which really governs this whole space. And, and the, the ability of microgrids to operate within the larger grid is not accommodated by that. So even though in, in, in California, San Diego Gas and Electric, which is my utility, is rapidly moving toward renewables and microgrids, 27%, uh, I'm sorry, that's the water, 30% uh, of my utility is renewables at this point, and it's changing by about 10% every five years. Uh, so they're, they're on track to be 50% uh, renewable w by the end of, of uh, the next decade. Uh, but it's the public utility law that controls whether uh, the, whether the, the uh, microgrids that they're also incorporating in community solar can operate on the grid. And that's something that, that SDG&E does not control. Uh, Lisa talked about uh, sustainable water action uh, at Mars. Uh, but water, and, and Admiral Phillips referred to water law. And so we can be, uh, we can take action to say we're only going to use sustainable uh, water sources. But if, as is the case in California, you have water rights as a farmer that to use all the water you want without any consequence, for the downstream user, and in, most, in much of California, the public consumer is the downstream user, it doesn't matter how sustainable the business sector is because agriculture 
has the first dibs and is going to just use it. Health. Public health concerns require government action in order to enable business implementation. Then uh, agriculture, I think it was Eric uh, who brought up the issue of GMOs. It, okay, sorry. Um, right. So this is, you know, what's the answer to that soil moisture decrease that I said was occurring and was accelerating? It is drought tolerant species, but in this country, we aren't allowed to do anything other than breeding. No GMOs for drought resistance. Uh, and you highlighted that very well. There are other uh, aspects of, of agriculture, pest tolerance. Uh, I'm not talking about putting a Roundup gene and the you know, Roundup resistance gene in the plant. I'm just saying, you know, can you breed something that is uh, more tolerant to uh, the cotton weevil or more tolerant to the corn borer than, than the current? We can't do that. Business is not allowed to go there. Uh, just a couple of others. Uh, there were several presenters who referred to carbon pricing. And multiple companies have plans in place if there's a price on carbon, whether that comes as cap and trade or a tax or a, a redistribution or whatever. But they can't act on them without a signal. And so I think that what this says is that although we have the sense that, that business can adapt on its own, that it can uh, start working this, your hands are tied. And it means that I think that the business community, uh, business schools like Wharton, need to start emphasizing that dependence in a way that leads to, uh, to more attention to this, that frees you to be able to do what will be the answer to this. Because I don't think the answer to solving all these problems is go government edicts. I think that it is. The, the responsiveness of business making money on good ideas that are, that are going to innovate us out of this. But if you can't, if you can't uh, implement the good idea because your hands are tied by this kind of uh, regulation that's really based on models, not just from the 70s, but uh, you know, as you mentioned, but models that are based back in the 30s and the 20s, um, there, there isn't a path forward. Uh, I loved your comment, are we ready to start admi stop admiring the problem? And I've talked a little bit about uh, mitigating risk and the problem of the, the, uh, the real uh, way that government and business are tied together here. Um, but adaptation uh, is another. Uh, a side of this, and you're trying to adapt by adapting your own business practices and putting in place innovations that allow others to adapt. But if we can't uh, do that, uh, the risks that you have of your own, like water supply for uh, companies dependent on it, uh, temperature issues, agriculture, etc., will be multiplied by the inaction of others not just in this country, but in other countries as well. And business will lose the advantage that, it had, that it's trying to build in by building business models that are sensitive to sustainability. If you're sustainable, but nobody else is, uh, and their inaction uh, obviates yours, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And then the, the last uh, problem here is the problem of accelerating change. So we're talking about adaptation and mitigating risk, looking at the, the uh, amount of extreme events and disruption that we have now, but it's actually accelerating. Every single one of those factors, temperature, uh, precipitation, flood, uh, sea level rise, et cetera, are accelerating. So we can't take a path that is just looking at dealing with where we are now or even looking linearly uh, ahead. Uh, 
And uh, another issue here is that the, the window is starting to close for action. And what we do in this decade is really going to set the stage for whether, for the degree of uh, suffering as opposed to mitigation and adaptation that we'll experience. And uh, the, uh, each, so during the, during the um, uh, 2010, uh, 10s, uh, we're on track to emit two teratons of CO2. And each trillion tons contributes about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Uh, on the present uh, trajectory, uh, during the 2030s, we're on a track for 3 trillion tons, and the 50s, 4 trillion tons. That means that we exceed wh what is not a scientifically defined danger point, but a politically defined danger point of 2 degrees centigrade of warming by 2050. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's only 30 years basically 30 years away. So it's really this time that we have to do something about this. And it's not just what we do about it as individuals or what we do about it as business, but it's capturing the attention of the governments that put such a strong uh, imprint on this, not just by inaction, but by the existing uh, uh, existing laws, regulations, and policies that are out there. So I want to, uh, I have a couple slides here from uh, one of my colleagues at Scripps, uh, Ramanathan, who's really one of the, uh, it was one of the leaders in, in climate, not only for CO2, but also for the impact of what we call black carbon, other radiatively active gases. And Ramanathan is the person who convinced uh, Pope Francis to change his encyclical from a general encyclical about environment to an encyclical specific to climate change in advance of uh, the Paris uh, COP21. So what he looks at uh, is it's really, uh, prediction is probably the wrong word. He, he uses prediction, but I would say that it's uh, an extension based on, on uh, our current uh, path that in 15 years we start exceeding the thresholds for dangerous climate change. And in 50 years, and he would define that as 1.5 degrees centigrade, in 50 years, or uh, in, in 35 years, we exceed the two degree threshold. And at that point, all of our models tell us that we have a 5% chance for catastrophic changes. And, but, and that's in addition to all the floods and whatever. Ca what are catastrophic changes? Changes, in, for example, in loss of a significant portion of one of the, the ice sheets that would, that would allow sea level rise to uh, really accelerate. Uh, another catastrophic change would be, for example, a change in the, uh, a permanent change in the paths of major storms that would further decrease the precipitation to the major food belts of the world. That's catastrophic change. So a 5% chance of that. Uh, three and a half billion exposed to uh, more of these deadly, it's not that every day is deadly, it's that you have deadly heat waves regularly. Uh, two and a half billion ex, uh, exposed to uh, the, the uh, vector-borne diseases like dengue and chikungunya uh, that we don't have, um, we don't have uh, uh, solutions for, uh, droughts, et cetera. So a 5% chance for catastrophic change. So I flew into Philadelphia yesterday. When I landed, I, I, I landed at uh, about 2.15 and heard about the Southwest uh, flight. So um, and this, this is, uh, uh, who, who was it that showed the uh, Trump ad 
for the Syrians? Ed Rubin. Ed Rubin, yes. Uh, if three are deadly, would you take a handful? So this is sort of the obverse of that. Uh, a 5% probability for catastrophic climate change. Would you get on a plane that had a 5% possibility of crashing? That's uh, 1 in 20. Uh, so I want to end there. And it's not so much the, the message is not the, the gloom and doom about, you know, oh, catastrophic change. It is that we do have the ability to change the trajectory. But we don't have the ability to change the trajectory as individuals, as academics, as uh, all of the, the people who kept getting up and saying, you know, um, why, do, why don't people understand this? Why, why don't they, you know, why is it that only 33% feel that scientists know what they're talking about? Uh, and I think the real key to that is the business community. Because it's true that a lot of, of uh, voter motivation uh, uh, comes from individuals who don't look at risk in the same way that you do. But a lot of the investment that, uh, and uh, the advocacy funding and, quite frankly, the lobbying that changes law does come from the business community. And so my call to you is for business schools like Wharton and business community to start approaching this in a proactive way rather than a reactive way. And I think all of the adaptation that we're talking about is reactive. It's time to look at the source of what makes that, uh, what, what makes it uh, ineffective, what makes it less powerful what makes it, uh, what pulls your punches. And I think that's the, the piece that comes right up against uh, all of the inhibitions and the lack of incentives. So that's my message. And uh, it's been a pleasure to, to hear all of you talk today. And it's given me a great um, uh, deal more optimism uh, than I had before I was here. It's not that I, uh, I absolutely don't believe that the uh, business community created all the problems. I think that if we had known in uh, 1870 uh, that, that uh, we were going to have this kind of problem with CO2, we would have developed energy in a very different way. Uh, I don't think we purposefully uh, caused this, this problem. But I do think that we have the solutions, and the solutions are in the implementation and the action. And that is for sure your backyard. Thanks so much. Thank you.